well. Okay, we're started last week. We started Balayla Hu Tafshin Chav. So let's just recap since it's almost a week since we learned. Let's just review what we where we're up to now, and then we'll move on to chapter three in the Maimer. So we asked, why is it that the, 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 the verse that describes God not being able to sleep, well, Achashverish not being able to sleep, that the king's sleep was disturbed, why is that referred to as the, the main, the turning point in the miracle of, of Purim? It seems to be just a minor detail within the story, not the turning point. We explained that this, the king's sleep being disturbed refers to which king? The Abish, their God, that God's sleep was disturbed. So Rebbe asks, that only reinforces the question. First of all, it doesn't answer the question. Still, why is that the turning point? And secondly, it opens up a whole new line of questioning, which is, well, how is it possible that uh, the Abishur should be sleeping? God should sleep. We know the verse says that God neither slumbers nor sleeps. So how, how would we say that he sleeps? And we explained it by prefacing a teaching of the Baal Shem Tov on the Pasuk Havai Silcha that Hashem is your shadow. And we said, what does it mean that Hashem is your shadow? That just as a shadow mimics everything you do, mimics your movements, the same thing is with God, that God mimics our movements. And we quote from the Zoyar that if we are happy, then we're shown happiness from above. And conversely, the opposite is true. If, you're, if we're not happy, then we, it has the opposite effect. But for a moment, we can just think about this because this, I think, is an important part of where this mimer is going to take us. The idea that Hashem, that God is our shadow, that mimics the things we do. Um, what does that mean in practical terms when... Um, you think about people that upset you or get you nervous or on the other hand in the positive people that make you happy so it's the people that you care about people that you don't care about even if they can upset you antagonize you and bother you but they can't really get under your skin if you don't like them or if you have no connection with them so you move on you know how to be a bigger man and move on and get over it but it's the people that you care deeply about that have the biggest impact on your mood so the fact that we say that that if we're happy it makes Hashem happy you think about it, and just like your children are happy or your spouse is happy, that makes you the happiest. If you have a happy wife, happy life. For all those chassanim here in the, at the table. Um, if, if, why? Because they're, 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 they matter so much to you. You're so connected to them so that their moods affect you. And their actions affect you and they affect you deeply. So this idea that Hashem Tzilcha, that Hashem is impacted by us, reflects the great connection that we have. On one end you could say it seems petty. Why would God care how we're acting, let him get over it, to let him move on. But on the contrary, it shows the depth of the connection with, he, with him. So that's, that's the first thing we said. So the fact that, so, so what does that mean? That since we are sleeping in, in exile, in Gaulus, we're, we're asleep at the wheel as it were. So, so too, God in turn is also asleep. It causes that God should seemingly be asleep. Now, while we're saying that God's asleep, obviously, the idea of God not sleeping, not slumbering, is also in effect. It's also... God at the same time is both sleeping on the one hand and on the other hand, he's, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. So we'll get to that in a moment about the fact that why, it is, what, what does it mean that God is actually not sleeping, but at least on the surface, in the regular structure of things, in the order of things, God is acting as if he's sleeping. What does this mean? So we explained, what does it mean when, we're, when, when a person's asleep? So a person is sleeping is primarily noticeable in their eyes. When you close your eyes, that's when you're sleeping. And what does that mean? Not just your physical eyes and physical sight, but also intellectual. A person is an intelligent being, and we have the ability to see, to understand things in, in, with our mind's eye, and also to understand things. And that's the, the idea of the, sort of a, a metaphor for hearing. When we hear, like it says, that it's, it's when we hear that we can discern things, we can identify things and categorize things. So there's the, the mental capacity that we have that's, that's active when we're awake. But when we're sleeping, so all of these faculties sort of retreat into, their, into the essence. They retreat and therefore they're working less efficiently, less potently, and, and the result, it can also be all over the place. And that's why you can see things that you can't really see. You can hear things. You can't tell the difference between good or bad. That's why people can have nightmares and dreams where they can't, they can't differentiate from reality and fiction and fantasy. It all, becomes, it all comes together because all these faculties that we have that when a person's awake are all functioning properly are not functioning the right way. So the same is true in exile. When we serve God... So we have to serve him in a way of seeing and hearing. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad. That's hearing. Seeing, we have to see and hear God. And in fact, during temple times, 
we did see and hear God. When we went to the temple, we had the 10 miracles that were there on a daily basis. You went there, you saw godliness, you saw miracles with your own physical eyes. And we saw God, just as God says, you come to be seen, we also see Him. So we're able to see godliness in the time of the temple. And this meant everything was flowing properly, which is why during temple times we had a Jewish monarchy, we, had, we, had, we were a power in the world, and we, we, controlled, we had uh, self-determination. We controlled our own, our own lives. But then what happens in exile? In exile becomes a time of sleeping, meaning that we don't see. We don't see, we don't hear, we don't discern. When we don't see, we don't hear, that causes for God to be sleeping. What does it mean that God is sleeping? He also doesn't see, doesn't it? Meaning that just as when we're sleeping, there is seeing and there is hearing, it's just going on in a chaotic, weaker state. So the same thing is, now there's still energy coming from above. Obviously, God is always showering everybody and everything with energy, divine energy and, and, and with blessing. But it comes down in a chaotic way and it goes to the wrong places, which is why the wicked can prosper and the righteous can suffer. Because while the energy is coming, but it's coming in, an, in, in, in a chaotic, non-awake uh, uh, sort of way. So that's, that's the idea of sleeping. So even though God should technically be listening, he should be attuned to the cries of the righteous and listening to them, but instead what's happening is you have the opposite uh, reality playing out. So how do we break this cycle? How do we wake up from our sleep? So the answer is through self-sacrifice. While our conscious faculties and capacities are asleep, self-sacrifice represents the essence, is an expression of essence. So I think you could say, like, um, like um, when a person's sleeping, you're still alive. You're not, right, a person sleeps, but they wake up in the morning, meaning that you're still alive. There's still an essential life force that's still going through you. It's just that your conscious self is asleep and therefore working in a, in a, in a chaotic way. But the subconscious or the essence is, is still functioning. You're still a living person. So that's still there, and that's still act you can still activate it. And that's the idea of self-sacrifice. Why? Because self-sacrifice is not something that's intellectual. It's not a process that you go through. And we're gonna, we'll learn soon, in chapter 3, we'll get into a little bit more detail about the nature of self-sacrifice. But the point is that it's not, it's not an intellectual thing. It's not something that you process. It's an, a, it's an expression of the essence. And so when we express that essence, that's the idea of waking up. That causes God to do the same thing. So since the Jewish people, in the time of the, of the decree of Haman, had self-sacrifice because the decree of Haman was only against Jews that, uh, that remained true to their faith. But if they were to convert out of the faith, they would, be, they would not be subject to this, uh, to annihilation. Um, and yet, none of the Jews, not a single Jew, and this is the Alter Rebbe says in, in Tehir Ur, famously, that, that not a single person um, even entertained the thought of, of abandoning their faith. Didn't even entertain the thought. Not a single, not, not one. And for the entire year. So that was a great expression of self-sacrifice. That self-sacrifice in turn awakened God's essence. And so that's the idea also of, of God waking up. It wasn't just the waking up. It's a, sort of a lower level of godliness. It, we're talking about at a higher level, a level of essence. And that's, that's, how, that's what we explain. But still, uh, we need to understand what this means. What, the nature of exactly how that works, that self-sacrifice, that self Mr. Znevich, wakes us up. Um, and, and how it is that we could wake up. If you're asleep, so what prompts that self-sacrifice to activate and that, for, that thing, for that process to happen? So that we're going to explain by uh, discussing and exploring a few verses in Song of Songs in Shir Hashirim. So before we continue with chapter 3, page Kofiud in our handouts, uh, with, with chapter 3, let's take a look at a few verses in Song of Songs so that we have an idea, context, and then we'll, because we're going to now be analyzing these few verses. So Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 1 opens with the words Basi Lagani, the last discourse that we learned. But we're going to focus on verse 2. So it says like this, Ani yishena, I'm asleep, v'libi er, my heart is awake. We talked about that already in chapter 2. I'm asleep, but my heart is awake. Then the verse continues, Koil doidi, the sound of my beloved, doifek, he's knocking, and he's saying, pischili, open for me, achaisi, my sister, rayasi, my bride, Yainasi, my dove, Samasi, my perfect one, my perfection. Shereishi nimla tol, because my head is full of, of dew. Kvutsoisai, my long locks of here, Rasise Lilo with the drops of uh, night rain. Then verse 3, Pashatati eskutanti, I have removed my, my, my garment. Eichacha el bashana, how can I put it back on? Rachatsti esragla, I have washed my feet. Eichacha 
Atanfim, how, how can I make them dirty? So what's going on here? The verses, obviously we know Song of Songs is a metaphor for the relationship between God and the Jewish people, and we know that there are multiple layers of meaning and explanation, so Rashi explains this one way, the other commentators explain it another way. Um, we're, let's, we're going to focus on the literal meaning of, this, of these verses, and then see how the Rebbe translates it in the, in the Mimer. So, what's happening here in the verse is that God says, it's, you know, it's late at night, it's the middle of the night, and suddenly I hear... The Jewish people say, I'm, I'm asleep. I'm Yishena, I'm asleep. And as we learn from the Zoyar, asleep meaning at, in Golos. Libi air, my heart is awake. Who's my heart? My heart is God. God is awake. Right? As we ended last, at the end of chapter 2, Sur Levavi Vechelki, God is the heart of the Jewish people, and he's awake. And so, middle of the night, he comes knocking at the door. I hear the sound. And what is he saying? He's crying out, Pischili, open, open the door for me. Why is he knocking on the door? Why is he coming in the middle of the night knocking on the door? Because he says, open for me. Why? Because he loves us. He says, my, my sister, my bride, my dove, my perfect one. That's how, he, that's how he thinks of us. And so he's begging us to open the door for him. And he says, I'm outside at night. The dew is already descending. And my head is now covered in dew. And my, my locks of my hair, are, 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 have the drops of the night rain that are on, on, my, on my hair. Open the door for me. And what did the Jewish people answer? What does the bride answer from the other side? I'm sorry, I skipped it. I wanted to read one more verse. I, I left it out, an important one. Um, what, did, what, what does the bride say? The bride says, Pashatati is kutonti. I, re- I already got undressed. I've undressed. I've gotten into my pajamas. I have to get dressed again to open the door for you. I brushed my teeth already, right? Um, and then he says, and then the bride also says, um, I took a shower. And now to get out of bed, to come open the door, I'm going to get all dirty again. In other words, what, was the, what are the Jewish people telling God? They said, We're already got, we've gotten used to life without you. And I don't know how to come back into a relationship with you. You're knocking on the door, but I've moved on. I've, I've gotten into my pajamas. I've washed myself clean of you. I, I, I can't, I, I can't come better, open the door. I, we're not judging anybody. We're just we're translating the Pasuk. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, better, yeah. So, so verse 4, so, so what happens? Here's God standing outside, knocking, begging us, professing His love for us, and we say, we've moved on. So what does verse 4 say? My lover stuck his hand into the hole, into the, into the, the keyhole, in, or, in order to unlock the door by himself. And my innards, my stomach, my innards, um, were broken for him, or, or, or churned inside of me for him, meaning I had this deep yearning for him. So when he comes knocking on the door and he's telling, he's calling me my sister, my bride, my perfect one, my dove, we're still not so moved. We say, Pashatati es kutanti, I've removed my, my garments. We don't want to open the door. So God says, you know what, you don't want to open the door for me, I'll open it myself. He sticks his hand into the keyhole, Shalach, he puts his hand into the hole, and when we see his hand in the hole, so may I humble love, that stirs us and moves us, and we're overwhelmed with feeling for him. These verses are now the subject of the, the next section of the Mimer, the meat of the Mimer, where we're going to explore the mis- mystical meaning of these psukim. Okay, so let's go, chapter 3. So, after the verse which we quoted earlier was, it says, Ani yishena, that I'm asleep and my heart is awake, and since my heart is awake, meaning that God is awake, even though Ani yishena, I'm sleeping in exile, but since God is awake. So that stirs me to Mesir Snefesh, to self-sacrifice. So then, Mam Shechakosov, the Pasuk continues and says like this, Koil doidi doifek, pischili achaisi, rayasi, yainasi samasi. The sound of my lover, is, he's knocking on the door and he's asking, he's crying out, pischili, open for me, my sister, my bride, my dove, my perfection. What does this mean? When God is referred to as doidi, my lover, that's the, an expression of love. This refers to the great love that God has in His essence above. The, the love that's rooted in God's essence for us. To the essence of our soul down here. Why is it, why is it that doidi, that we're referring to God as our lover, why is it that when we refer to Him here as our lover, it's referring to this great, overwhelming, essential love that God, ha- God has for us? Why is that? Why do we say that? Because, because notwithstanding the fact that we've sinned and we've been damaged and we've, we've gone astray, until we're missing all of these different levels of, of, of virtue. 
Not only are we not perfect, we're not doves, we're not, we're not uh, brides, we're not even God's sister, as we're going to explain later, the meaning of these levels, of what do all these mean in our relationship to God, we'll get to later, but they all represent different levels of, and different aspects of our relationship with God. But we're not, we're not, we don't have that. We're not at that level. So never, notwithstanding all this, nevertheless, he's knocking. You see, if we had these levels, if we were then God wouldn't have to knock. He wouldn't be behind the door outside in the dark, in the rain. So the fact that God is outside and he's knocking on the door and it's raining and it's, and it, and it's cold and he's knocking and calling out. Why is he calling out? Because if, if, we're, if we have such a wonderful, warm and fuzzy relationship with him, then there's no need for him to call out to us. So the fact that he's calling out means that we don't have these things. So what's prompting him to call out? The fact that he loves us essentially. And how is he referred to before we, you know, when we have this sort of a strange relationship, he's still our lover. Why? Because there's a love that God has for us that's essential, and therefore it's not affected by any of these levels of our relationship. So he need my my lover is knocking vitzayik and he's shouting and he says pischili open for me. Shazehu mitzata ava atzmis. This is because of the essential love that God has for us. Kamei like the verse says, hafti eschem omer avaya. God says I love you, and, and like the verse continues, afalpisha ach esav liyakev. Even though the verse continues, haloy ach esav liyakev. God says I love you, and though Esav and Yaakov are brothers. Meaning, what does it mean when we say, the verse says, meaning that they're, they're similar, they look the same, they're related. Meaning neither one seems to be any better than the other. So even in a situation where Esav and Yaakov seem to be the same, nevertheless, nonetheless, I love Yaakov and I hate Esav, I despise Esav. Right? So this verse expre- expresses the deep love that God has for us. Why is it that if Esav and Yaakov are brothers, why do I still love Yaakov and not Esav? Because I have an essential of a hafti yeschem, amr avaya. There's an essential love that goes beyond it. So there's, there, there, there are different layers to any relationship. There's a conscious uh, layer where we do things for each other, and because we do things for each other, we interact in a loving way, in a positive way, in a friendly way. So therefore we have a relationship on a conscious level a meaningful relationship. But then there's the essential bond between two people. Not everybody, I mean, if you strip it away, eventually you can find that really between any, any two people. But certainly if you look at it, you know, in a family, let's say, uh, a parent and a child, so the, the, their relationship, there's an essential love between them. We're going to get some ta'achosi. There's a, a, a deep bond between them that is not affected by behavior. So a parent remains... The, you know, a, a parent of a child, even if the child misbehaves, even if the child doesn't, even if they don't get along, even if they have a very combustible relationship, nonetheless, that bond is always there. So it's the same idea with God. Our relationship with God works on a conscious level, depends on what we do for Him, the mitzvahs that we perform, the Torah we learn, how sensitive and open we are to Him. Good, that affects the conscious relationship we have with Him. But then there's a bond that runs deeper than that. It's a bond that is not dependent on that. It's not a bond that's built on anything we do. It's an essential bond. And so when we say kol doidi doifeg, that our lover is coming and knocking on the door, he's referred to as doidi, he's knocking on the door, he's begging come in, he's begging open it for me, meaning that we're not in that level. There's no conscious relationship here. There is no wonderful, overt, open relationship here. It's, it's completely concealed, it's completely dormant. And nevertheless, that relationship, that love is still strong, it's still an essential love. And that's what's prompting him to knock and to ask us pischili. So, what, what could God expect, though, from us when, um, when, when we don't have any of these conscious levels of love, when we're not actually consciously serving God? So then what could He expect from us? Oh, suddenly, we, because He's knocking, suddenly we're going to be overwhelmed with love? That's probably not realistic. And even if it were to happen, it would be totally superficial. It wouldn't be real. So what is He expecting of us? So, so the verse continues and says like this, when he's knocking, when my lover is knocking on the door, so what's he asking? Open. All he's asking is to open it for him. What does this mean? Our sages tell us, open for me, like the point of a needle, and I will open for you like the opening of the, of the temple. 
I'm referring specifically to the doors of the temple, but, but it's any big hall, to, like the doors of a big hall that open very wide. The Adua, it is known, there are two versions of this, sent, of this teaching of the sages in the Medrash. Yesh Girsa, there's one version that says that God asks, peacefully open, like the eye of the needle. What is the charara? What is the eye of the needle? It's the hole in the needle through which you put a string. Now, you can, the, the hole of the, the eye of the needle is tiny. It's minuscule, but it still takes up space. You have to be able to fit a string through it. But the, ver, the, the version of this teaching that's brought throughout Chsidis is like the tip, the point of the needle. What's the difference? The hole of the needle has some kind of dimension. The kivan since the the thread needs to go through the needle. Notwithstanding how thin and fine this thread might be, it still has some type of dimensions. And therefore, since it has some kind of dimensions, the opening needs to have dimensions. There needs to be an opening, a space that has a minuscule dimension, but a dimension nonetheless through which it can fit. But the tip, the point of the needle, that's where the, the, the needle gets narrower and narrower. Till it reaches the point which afterwards is only nothing. Meaning the very tip of the needle, if you're to strip away all the, the point, if you keep stripping away all you know the, the, the dimensions around it, you get to the point, the very point of the point, the essence of the point of the needle, what comes if you strip that away? Nothing. nothing. There's nothing. So there's nothing there. So when we talk about the, eye, the point of the needle, there are no dimensions to it. What is this, why, why, why is this relevant? This is why the point of the needle represents self-sacrifice. Because self-sacrifice has no dimensions it has no explanation logical in the mind, and not even an emotional explanation. Not any type of explanation whatsoever. It's simply a point, without any length, width, or depth at all. What, what does this mean? That the Mesiris Nefesh has no explanation because what are we talking about when we say Mesiris Nefesh of sacrifice? It means total, uh, giving yourself totally away without any personal expression. While, while you're not expressing yourself in any way when you have self-sacrifice, on the other hand, you're completely invested in it. His entire being is invested in that moment. What, what does this mean? When we talk about self-sacrifice, so generally we, we, we start to relate it into terms that, uh, that, that make sense to us. So you talk about somebody dying for a cause, right? That's what we think, self-sacrifice. We think somebody dies for something. But dying for a cause is not self-sacrifice. That's not Mr. Snefesh. What's Mesir Snefesh? Al Rebbe says in Tanya that what's proof of our essential bond with God is Mesir Snefesh. Is that the Kal Shabakalim is willing to give his life for, for God. That, the, in, that throughout our history, throughout the history of the Jewish people, there have been people, and again, we're not going to get into a conversation about the fact that there are people that aren't, that, because the point is even if there's only one person in history, it already proves the point. That, that if, if, because we have to understand what does it mean. So the point is that it's not just one person in history, but throughout history there, are, there have been so many people who have not been particularly into their Judaism, have not been particularly devoted to God, and yet when they were faced with the challenge of giving, denouncing God or giving up their lives, they gave up their lives. Why? So maybe some people there's an ulterior motive. I can understand if you're a religious Jew and you, you, know, you may be a rabbi and you preach to everybody, all your neighbors, you talk to them about how important God is and how important serving God is. And then, you know, somebody comes with a gun and says, you know, give it up. Or, so if you just give it up, so how are you going to face your neighbors the next day? Oh, it's important to you until it's your life. So you're going to give up your life just to, to save face. In a way, it's self-preserving. It's self-serving. That's not self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice means there's nothing in it for me. In fact, if you look at it, the scenario that al Rebbe tells us in Tanya, about a Kal Shabbat what that you should give up God or, or face death. What does it mean to give up God? How do you give up God? 
So what's the, the analogy? The, 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 the scenario is bow to an idol. What happens when a person bows to an idol? A person could bow to an idol and still be faithful to God. They know in their heart they're devoted to God. They're only ba- it's only an external act. It's not something that they've, they've suddenly now found, seen the light and embraced a new religion, embraced a new God. So if somebody's coming and, and threatening you and telling you, I want you to worship idols or else your life is, is, is over, so what's the problem? So you do the hollow act without your heart in it. God certainly knows what's in your heart. It's a hollow act. And yet people are not capable of doing it. Not even a hollow act. So on one hand, the, the act they were doing was a meaningless act to them. They still could be faithful to God. And it wasn't serving any benefit to them. And yet they were still incapable of doing it. They're incapable of even on, uh, giving the appearance of disconnecting from God. Why is that? Why is that? Because in our essence, our essence is one with God. And therefore can't ever even give the appearance of being disconnected from God. When it's activated. That's why it happens. So there's no explanation for it. That's exactly why it happens. But, why, but, it's, but there's no explanation for why the person, if you ask a person, why are, you not, why are you giving your life? They have no good reason. It's not for a cause. They have no even emotional reason because we're talking about somebody who may, may, has no emotional feeling to God or to Judaism necessarily. So there's no rational reason. There's no emotional reason. There's no reason whatsoever. They simply cannot do otherwise. And, and this plays out in different ways in this. You know, there are people that have given up their lives um, <coughs> And, and proclaim and, and say Shema Yisrael when they're dying. And it might have been a, a verse proclaiming God's oneness. They might not fully understand the verse and they may have not, haven't said it in 40 years. But somehow the moment that they're dying they have to proclaim God's oneness. They have to announce that they are one with God. What prompts them to do that? What moves them to do that? Only the essence. There's no explanation for it. So explanation represents dimensions. There's width, there's depth, an explanation, you understand something, you know, it has its spiritual dimensions. Emotions have emotional dimensions. But essence have, has no dimensions. So when God says, open for me, like the point of the needle, what is he asking for? He's saying, I have this essential love with you, I want to trigger that essential love in you too. And what does that involve? Opening the door, not even a crack, without any dimensions whatsoever. Just that point. Without any explanation, without any dimensions. That's how much he wants us to open it. And once we get in there, then already he can do the rest. But he, that's what he wants. So, so this point, a point that has no dimensions, the point of Mesir Nefesh, the point of, of recognizing our essential bond with God, and that we can have it no other way, regardless of our conscious state, regardless of the fact that we're fast asleep. So this point, pierces a hole in this iron curtain, that separates between Israel and their father in heaven. This is the meaning of Pischili, open for me. That through this, God says, you just open that crack and I'll do the rest. I'll open it like the doors to a ball, a ballroom. And, and, and the Rebbe says, I, th- I think later in this Mimer, or elsewhere, that, that, that when we talk about the Ulam, so there's the Ulam in the Beis Hamikdash. The Ulam and the Beis Amigdash was the big hall in the, in the temple, and it had big, a big entryway, and the entryway had no doors. So it's not only like he opens a double, you know, a double door, that we went from a crack, from an akuda, from a point, without any dimension, to a double door opening, but a door that's wide open that can't even be closed, because it has no actual doors, it's just an open doorway. Well, the is a Afterwards, the verse explains, How is it that we can get from that crack to the opening of, of, of this, this open, wide open door? In other words, talking about also our heart being open wide to God. After the, the beginning with open for me, like the point of the needle, which is, as we said, as we explained. So after that comes the next levels of Achaisi, my sister, Rayasi, my, my, my bride, Yainasi, my dove, Tamasi, my perfect one. Those are levels that we go one step at a time from the point of Mesir Snefesh. And then we go one level higher and higher till the highest level of Tamasi. That's how that process starts. But it starts with peacefully open for me that crack like, uh, like um, the point of a needle. How are we doing on time? We're okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. Chapter four. Yeah, any questions? We're good? Okay. Why would he do the needle? Why would, why would the needle? The point of a needle has no dimensions, and that's like Mr. Snuffish that has no, no dimensions. There's no way to. Yeah. 
Okay. So after we've opened the door, Pischili, God continues, says, I want Pischili, and through that will be a chaisi, rayasi, and asi zamasi. So vinyim baze, kimavur, bemaim admor azok, and bebichol hanachas harap. They explained in a mimer of the Alter Rebbe that is, uh, that is brought in the Hanachis of Rabbin Chesrezi. There's a, there's a, a book of Hanachis of, 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 um, uh, of discourses that, were, of, that the Alter Rebbe said that were written up by Rabbi Pinchas Rezes, Pinchas of Shklov. Pinchas Rezes, who was one of the big famed Chesidim of the Alter Rebbe, who was known for the detail, the precision with which he would record the Alter Rebbe's words, every single word. So in his version um, of this discourse, Vishamu Bishinui Manitus Lukotera, where it's a little different than how it is in Lukotera, the, the way this verse, discourse is printed in Lukotera from a different version. Yeah, well, the ver- well, Lukotera is also the, the way they were either transcribed by the Alter Rebbe or by the Middle Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek. So the, this, the, 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 um, the, the transcriptions that were used in Lukotera are not the ones that were transcribed by Rabbi Pinchas raises. I mean, I don't know, this just random uh, historical footnote. This Fabrengen, I think we mentioned last week, was attended by uh, Zalman Shazar, who would eventually, this 1960s, before I think he became president of Israel, but he was at the Fabrengen, and he had actually been instrumental in printing books the, uh, of Chassidus, the first three volumes of, of Sefer Erchim, uh, the Chassidic Encyclopedia, and also some of the Amor of the Rebbe, and some of them say they're printed with, the, uh, with, with a grant from the cultural office of the, uh, something, I don't remember exactly what it's called, but that was his, right, so that was, that was his, he had done that, and I think this, this book was one of the volumes that he had helped print, um, and so maybe partly why maybe the Rebbe mentions Anachas of Pinchas Rezis, but anyway, the point is that this is uh, uh, based on uh, uh, what, what's brought in the Maimur of the Alter Rebbe that was transcribed by Rebbe Pinchas. Sha'achaisi moira al ha'avaydam shemitzat his oiris ha'avativis. What, is, what, what does it mean that God is referred to as our sister? That is the, the service, of the motivation to serve God that comes from a natural love for him. Just like a brother and sister, their love and their attachment, sister, the word has the same root as the word what's ichui mean? Ichui means a, a blending together, an attachment. There's a, a method of, of mending. Um, the Gemara talks about uh, Alexandris, like the Alexandrian form of mending. There's different ways of, like if you're to mend a garment, so you can stitch something up, you can attach a, a patch, or you can just stitch it up, and you can tell that it was, <coughs> that it was stitched up, that it had once been torn. But then there's a, another form of ichoy, of, of stitching it together, where it, it becomes mamish, you can almost undo the, that, that you can't almost even tell the difference. So it's a deep bond. So the idea of achois, a sister, represents a very deep bond, of, almost a fusion of, of, of two people, zela zeh, one to the other. Ein ein yishutzar chesber. This bond, this connection between a brother and sister, is not one that needs that needs any explanation. It's a natural bond. So it doesn't need um, any explanation. Havonavas varayis doesn't need any understanding or proof. Elazo inyan tivi behem. You don't need to rationalize why you love your sibling. It's natural. It's instinctive. You love your siblings. The chain who gam betchilas avayda so too is at the beginning of our service of God. Of, of, of God, kasher adai neimle muuma. When you have nothing, you haven't gotten anywhere yet. Ki im inyan a mesiris nefesh bavad. Simply you have mesiris nefesh, which mesiris nefesh which hamid vehevira says hatim ibegishdalta took you min akatsa akatsa. It put you in a whole different state. That till now you were totally. It was dormant. Your connection with God was totally insignificant, and not anything you're mindful of. And then the mysterious nefesh triggered an awakening that now you're ready to serve God, but you don't have anything. You just have this openness, this readiness. So what's the first step? Is shemaschil avidasim matam You're starting at the lowest on the lowest step. You have to awaken that natural love you have for God. That hidden love that we have inherited from our fathers. May Avram Avinu from Avram Avinu echadai Avram. Avram, Avram was one. We stop here. So let's just before we continue the next meaning. This is the first understanding of the of the level of achos, which is that there's the natural love with God. As Alter explains at length in Tanya, when a person trying to motivate us to serve God, to develop a feeling for God, so to develop a new feeling for God, is challenging. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of work. We're just getting started. We're rookies. We're on, we're on the first we're on the first floor. So how do we start? opening up to a love for God. So the way to do it is to reveal what's already there. 
the natural love of God that's already there. That requires less effort, less contemplation, because you're not trying to create something new. You're simply accessing what's triggering what's already there, the hidden love for God. So that's what the meaning of achoisi, that we're God's sister, as it were, meaning that there's a latent natural love that we inherit, just like our genes, just like our sibling relationships that are inherited, um, that are part of our DNA. There's that natural love for God that's already there that we want to tap into. That's the first meaning of achoisi. And then and we'll continue in chapter 4 to discuss another dimension, another layer to this level of achais, of, uh, of the sisterhood relationship with, with God. And we'll do that tomorrow? Thursday? Okay.